Welcome to another episode of the DBR Spotlight Podcast. We are your hosts, Hayden and Evan. Here we are. And at Compass Bible Church, we exist to make disciples of Jesus Christ by reaching people for Christ, teaching people to be like Christ, and training people to serve Christ. And reading the Bible all the way through every single year. That's right. Every <laughs> single year. But we're only doing the New Testament on the podcast. We are. But the whole church, we're doing Old Testament. And that's right. And yeah, come back next year and we'll do the Old Testament. That's right. And everything that we do here, including reading the Bible and talking about reading the Bible... And applying the Bible. Is to fulfill the mission of reaching, teaching, and training. All right, Compass, we are excited to get back into this resource as the DBR Spotlight Podcast so we can understand the Bible better so as, as we read it as a church together, we can better apply it and mm. worship God. Love it. All right, well, this week, Compass, we are going through Luke chapter 9 through 11. And since Luke is just so dense with theology and dense with things that are happening. And it, it, it was an orderly and thorough account, mind you, that Luke gave to Theophilus. <laughs> That's what he said. And you know, when Luke delivered because I'm like, wow, this is, I can't talk about this. So what we're going to do, Compass, is we are going to go through the top three things that you know, we notice in each chapter so that we can equip you to understand God's word. I mean, if we find other things, we'll chat with those as they come up. All right. So I'm going to do the top three, and if Pastor Hayden knows something, he'll chime in, Boom. and so we will help you understand Luke. So without further ado, so we can make good time, we actually need to go back to Luke chapter 8. It might be helpful that before we start reading, we remember what we read. Because in Luke 8, 22 to 56, we see the authority of Jesus displayed. We had Jesus calming the storm. He, his authority over the natural realm or creation. Jesus healed the demon-possessed man of a whole lot of demons and showing that he has authority over the spiritual realm and heals the unclean woman, showing that he has authority over disease or the fallenness of the world. And then finally he heals or really resurrects uh, Jairus' daughter, showing that he has authority over death. You know, Conquering sin, just foreshadowing, foreshadowing what's to come. Now, this is important because right in chapter 9, verse 1, he called the 12 together. This is something that we saw in Matthew and gave them power and what? Authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to do what? To proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Not just to go, go out and heal some people and be really nice. No, proclaim the kingdom of God. The Messiah is here. And this is important because it's not on their authority that they're doing anything. They're fully reliant on the authority of Christ and Christ alone to fulfill that mission. And that, and that same authority is in Matthew 28, has been given to me and now given to us to do what? To make disciples. Any, any quick thoughts, Pastor Hayden, as you are rolling through yeah, the commentary? It's just to look at this and to remember that all of this was done to prove that Jesus was the one who would save people from their sins. And when he uh, when he uh, got the 12 and sent them out, it was to help prepare that way for him to continue going and telling people, I am the Messiah that come to save the world from sin, and I'm going to show it through my message and through the uh, the miracles. All right, now, Compass, now, uh, top thing number one in chapter 9. Let's jump to verse 18, actually. So Luke 9, verse 18. We're going to kind of cover verses 18 to 27 quickly, talking about who Christ is. He's showing the authority of who this person is. And, mm -hmm. and then Peter, in verses 18 to 20, says, you are the Christ of God. He gets the answer, the answer right. So what happens next is Luke then describes what it looks like to follow this Christ, the Messiah that we're promised. They'd be like, I want to follow him. I want to follow you know, the Messiah. And he's like, I'm this guy. And also, this is what it's going to look like to follow me. And so if you jump down to verses 23 to 27, you're going to see what it takes to follow Christ. Really, it's you die. It's more than a physical death. No, you deny yourself. You die to yourself to follow Christ. And this is what essentially repentance and, and trust in Christ really looks like. Right. A repentance is a, a turning from myself and everything that I think is good and everything that I think is right to say, no, I, I'm wrong. And instead, to humble myself and say, no, 
I'm going to follow someone different because he is the one that leads me to life. Any any quick thoughts on you know taking up your cross and following Jesus? Verse 23, and he said to me, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And the, the fact is, is these texts help us see that easy believism is no way into the kingdom of God. And in, to come to the kingdom of God, there has to be a following of Jesus, who he is, his message, his mission, uh, and him as the Messiah. And like in Matthew, this that little speech of Jesus ends with saying, by, in verse 27, but I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, that can be confusing. That can be confusing. So I'll jump to right to what it means, because we talked about this already in Matthew. But what this means is literally, if you look at verse 20, 28, what's happening, the transfiguration. So there are some of you, who are some of them? Peter, here, James, and John. Got to see a taste of what the kingdom of God is like. And what's that like? To see the full power and glory of God the Son displayed. Mm -hmm. And so he became like dazzling light, and Mm -hmm. they were in huge fear. They didn't know what to do. And so the whole point is that Luke, in terms of, hey, this is the cost to follow Christ, Peter, James, and John got to see who they're really following. It's not just this human guy named Jesus. No, it's right. fully God, fully man, and this full power to go, yeah, it's definitely worth giving up my life to follow this guy. In verse 31, who appeared in glory. And so that just shows you like the, the parallel between until they see the kingdom of God. Well, right there, it says that Moses and Elijah appeared in glory, and Jesus was there also in that glory. And so it just kind of shows you that parallel between people did see that right then, right after that. And they were still alive. There you go. They won't taste death. There they are, alive, seeing the glory of the kingdom. So who is who is Jesus? We need to follow him, but it is worth following because he is the glorious one to follow. All right, Compass, now we are going to skip several verses to top uh, number two top thing of Matthew. Uh, the top Matthew. two number thing. Top two number thing of Luke chapter 9. We're going to figure this out as we go. I want to go down to verse 51. Verse 51 to 56. Now, this is where, you know, Jesus is rejected by the Samaritans, but there's some critical details. And it's funny, a lot of modern scholars, if they can go back and uh, do the chapter breaks again, they would add a chapter break right here. And to give you context, uh, Luke didn't write verse numbers and chapter breaks, mind you. It was just no, one those continuous. those later adaptations to the Bible. And so one person added chapters to kind of help organize the Bible so we can quickly remember where to go. And then another person did the job of memorizing verses. So... What what's going on here? Verse fifty one. When the day days drew near for him to be taken up, it means to be ascended to, after death and resurrection to be ascended. And this is actually something that if you got you go back to uh, where we just came from the transfiguration, Elijah and Moses. What were they talking about? Jesus ascending. So jump back to verse fifty one. Th- that day is being uh, coming close. What happened? He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Context. Where is he right now? Galilee. He's now wrapping up his mission in Galilee. So this is now, there's three parts to Luke, the mission of Galilee, the journey to Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem. And this is the beginning of part two of Luke. So I just want you to not note that in your Bibles. I, I did that right here saying, okay, this is the beginning of part two, the journey to Jerusalem. Now there's a whole section of stuff that's about to happen. Now, why get rejected by the Samaritans? Well, it's important because they were uh, the Jews and Samaritans were at odds at each other culturally. Briefly, we talked about this before, but real brief, the Samaritans were essentially um, ethnic half-breeds between Gentiles and Jews who were exiled by Assyria, came back and intermarried with the pagan culture, whereas the Jews who came back from exile later stayed only married to, to Jews. And so there was a separate worship place in Samaria that they turned to, but Jesus is now turning to Jerusalem, which the Samaritans rejected. And so they rejected them, uh, rejected Christ. And then you get, you know, uh, James and John saying, God, you want to call, call down fire from heaven? Why? Sodom and Gomorrah. He's like, hey, they're wicked. You know, it's worse off than them. And Jesus rebuked them and went to another village. And then what happens next, and this is number three of uh, Luke chapter nine, is another description of what the cost of following Jesus looks like. And it's it's a high cost. And it's really testing the heart of people. You have three different people that say they want to follow Jesus, and he attacks their heart. And it's really, we have to ask that same question. I want to follow Jesus. Why? 
Do you just want the benefits of Jesus? Do you want the benefits of getting out of hell or the benefits of being... Right. Which those are real, real benefits. Real benefits. And real reasons to want to follow Christ. But is it actually, no, I want to turn from my life and follow Christ and knowing that, yeah, it, there's mm-hmm. benefits to that. And so... Um, for the sake of time, we can t- ask Pastor Hayden and I about what are these three men going, th- these three people going through that Jesus says, don't do it that way. Essentially, he's saying... What are you talking about? Oh, there is the, in verse 57, excuse there me, 57 go. to 62. Thank you. Um, there's uh, three people say, I will follow you. And Jesus says, a response to them saying, not really. No, you don't. Do you know the cost of following me? Right. The point that Jesus is trying to drive here, I just want to get to the point, is the the mission of mercy that he's going to show is more than important than anything they have to do. Even right. if it's, oh, I want to be, I want to follow you. Oh, you don't have, we don't have a like home. If your main goal is to try to get your nice home or to take care uh, and uh, make sure that you can bury your, your dead family or to make sure that you can do your thing and the gospel, you have no, you have no place in the kingdom. The kingdom is primary. Uh, but the gospel also promises that if you will seek first the kingdom of God, uh, the other things will be taken care of as well. So it's really a, a definite order in in the expectation of God's kingdom that God wants you to take care of your priorities because that shows kingdom stewardship. But your priorities have to first be in line with the kingdom. And so he's always driving you to following me as a pursuit of the kingdom and of nothing else. All right, now let's go to Luke chapter 10, Compass. All right, so diligently, here we go. slowly take us through. Diligently, but quickly and clearly, chapter 10. So right off the bat, this is the top one, uh, number one thing of uh, chapter 10 is Jesus sends out the 72. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, this that's kind of nice. No, you need to write down Numbers 11, 16 to 25. Numbers 11, 16 to 25, because Jesus is really revealing he's a greater in Moses, and as Israel journeyed through the wilderness to the promised land as Jesus now journeying to Jerusalem. He's taking on the mission of Moses in a greater capacity. Why? Because, well, I'll get there in a second. But, um, well, why? Because there's a bigger promise than land. There's a promise of an eternal earth to come to, to be able to dwell in. So there's your why. Now, some of you ask me, go, well, Moses only appointed 70 elders. And I say, well, you need to read the Bible more closely. So 70 elders did go out to meet Moses because the Lord said, you know, this is too much for you, Moses. You, I'm giving authority to 70 men. And in verse 25 of Numbers 11, then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on 70 elders. That's pretty cool right there. And as soon as the spirit rested on, they prophesied, not, but, not, uh, but they did not continue uh, doing it. Now, the point is that God was giving authority to other men, like Jesus was giving authority to these disciples, and that's what he's doing. He's giving authority like Moses, but greater. Why? Because he's God. God gave authority, not mm-hmm. Moses. And now God is now doing authority. But where's the other two? Well, if you just go to verse 20, uh, verse 26 and number 11. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Meddad. And the spirit rested on them too, and they, uh, but they were not registered, and they have gone out to the tent, and they prophesied in the camp. So Jesus is really saying, oh, yeah, remember those other two in Numbers 11? Yeah, I'm sending 72 out just like God sent 72 out, even though Moses brought 70. So Good. there's a little fun fact Good. for and you. And I love how it said, and those elders prophesied but not but not continually, because it was to prove that God had really filled them with the Spirit and empowered them to do what God had commanded them to do. I love that. All right, now, Compass, number two is that we need to go to Luke ten twenty five to 37. Now, we're going to you know, jumping some information, but this is really critical. This is something that's familiar, but I bet that we don't really comprehend correctly. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we might la- read that and, land and conclude to go, Oh, it just seems like we just need to be nice people. Sure, but you're missing the point. The The point of the, a lot of the parables in Luke, especially in the journey to Jerusalem, so 951 on, is actually said in the very beginning. So if you read in the very beginning, uh, verse 25 of this parable, and uh, behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? And Jesus said to him, What is it written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus replied to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and live, and you will live. And so Jesus gives the answer. But verse 29, But the lawyer, wanted, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Then who is my neighbor? And then Jesus reveals through the parable, It's everybody. 
Right. It's any person that you're in contact with today and every human being is your neighbor. And that's why when we talk about mercy, even in today's sermon, we're not saying that we don't give mercy to people who aren't in the church. We're saying that we need to be merciful to those in the church, but without also discluding people who aren't in the church. Because at the end of the day, we are called to be merciful to everyone, but particularly those in the household of faith. And like in, in Matthew, we're about to, in the kind of the, uh, the uh, Beatitudes that we're going through, Jesus revealing who's really in the kingdom, this is what Jesus is doing. If you're really in the kingdom, you're going to love God and love others. That's how you know you know. But the guy wasn't doing it, so Jesus revealed in a parable. And who, who are the people that were the chosen people of God who didn't love their neighbor? The priest and the Levite, the people that they should have. These are people who had official designations in Israel as leaders, spiritual leaders. And you know this. It's in the title. Who is the person that loved? The neighbor. A Jewish person. A half-breed. A half-breed Samaritan. That nobody liked. And then Jesus is saying something controversial. This person is in the kingdom of God, not the Levite and priest. Just because you're a descendant of Abraham Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you are of Abraham. And so, and so that whole sermon or that whole uh, pericope there was about the lawyer trying to justify himself and Jesus saying, this isn't about you being justified in yourself because you won't be. Mm-hmm. This is about the fact that are you humble and willing to uh, follow God? Yeah, and his kingdom. The, and the, the lawyer wasn't because he wanted to f- justify himself. But a Samaritan, uh, in the eyes of a Jew, would never try to justify himself because he knows that even his own identity Discludes him from the family of God, which is the meekness, humility that everyone ought to have, realizing that they don't belong in the kingdom. There you go. Outside of Christ. All right. Well, last thing, compass in Luke chapter 10 to note is the Mary and Martha um, account right here where uh, the, Jesus came over. Martha's fixing the place up. Mary is listening at his feet. And Martha, so when a pastor pointed this out, I started to chuckle. He, you know, Martha goes up to Jesus and says, you tell her to help me. I and mean, here's Martha bossing God around. I'm like, wow, that's actually kind of a funny detail. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, But Jesus answered, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Martha has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Martha even was serving Christ, God or her, himself, Missed the point because her, the point was we need to listen to God and then follow. And so that's kind of the thing you need to take away from Luke chapter 10. All right. Well, wrapping things up in Luke chapter 11, we have to, we'll start right away with the banger. The first thing to know is Luke 11, 1 through 13, praying within the will of God. Now we mm-hmm. have the, the Lord's prayer that's also expressed in Matthew. Again, to note, what are we praying for God's will to be done? Really, it's conforming our will and submitting it and conforming it to God's good and perfect will. Mm-hmm. And now Jesus then gives in verse 5 to 13 two parables to kind of explain what and to explain what's going on. First parable is a uh, which one of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, let me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and have nothing to set before him. And he will answer uh, answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. And so the the parable is essentially saying, you know, if you ran to someone at you know, one in the morning and say, hey, I, I forgot to go to H-E-B. My relatives are here. Can you can you uh, help me here? Mm-hmm. The point is... They're going to help. They're going to help. But, you know, he's going to begrudgingly help. God wants to quickly help. That's right. And then finally, the second... God's not going to forsake you and withhold from you. That's right. So then that leads into the second parable, which talks about a father giving a good gift to his kids. And so, but does that mean, though, I can ask anything? It says here in the test, if, you, if I ask, I'll find, and it's, you know, if I knock, it'll be opened. Is that what it's talking about? No, if you pray within the will of God. It's keeping the Lord's prayer. You will receive it. Right. If I want the Lamborghini real badly and, and it's not going to help me out, God's going to be like, no, I'm not going to give you a snake when you need fish. That's right. All right. Well, number two of Luke 11 is actually found in verse 33. So we are going to talk briefly about the light in you. So this is actually a reference back to Luke 8, 16, uh, 16 to 18 where Jesus talks about no one after lighting a lamp puts it under in the cellar or under in a basket but on a stand so that the, those who enter may see the light. Essentially what Jesus is trying to get at is how are you reacting to the words and work of Jesus Christ? 
Are you going to rightly submit to him and follow him and shine bright? Or are you going to reject and just cover it up and say, I'm not going to listen. I'm going to ignore this light like it doesn't exist. And so really the short point of this is to understand how are we reacting to the light of Christ through his word, his spoken word, and through his work. All right. And then lastly, jump down to verse 37 to 54. We're going to talk about the woe to the Pharisees and lawyers. What Jesus is doing here, he's attacking the Pharisees, who, again, who look religious. As, as Pastor Hayden mentioned last week in the sermon, they didn't want to break the Sabbath law. They added so many rules, so they didn't break it. And the lawyers really helped them and said, yeah, this is a good law. And really, they're focused as the Pharisee was upset that Jesus didn't wash before dinner. Where is that in the Bible? Where, where does it say you need to wash before dinner right. in the law of Moses? You don't. And so Jesus reveals their wicked heart quite powerfully and quite um, precisely because he really needs them to understand that their hearts are completely far from God. They're so focused on outward, moralistic, legalistic behavior and not really working towards the, the, the heart of the issue. And hence why as a church, it's like, oh, why don't we do all these nice things to people? No, we do these nice things to these people, but we really want to make sure that they know the gospel. If someone is, you know, in need, we're going to meet the need. But if we fail to preach the gospel, okay, they got their need met, and then what? It's like a a, a video I saw of a charlatan proposing as some faith healer who supposedly did some act of faith, and he just stared at this person and then he goes, you know, just God just loves you. I'm like, well, that's the opportunity to say, hey, I was only able to do this with the power of the Holy Spirit because I have repented of my sins and trusted in Christ. Well, he didn't because he doesn't believe that first and foremost. But and so these are the same things with the Pharisees and law the lawyers. They're adding these rules, thinking they're trying to be holy, and we're not focused on their heart to worship God. And so at the after the end of that, when when Jesus just pronounces these woes on the lawyers and the uh, lawyers and the um, priests, you know they they began to oppose Jesus fiercely as it says in verse 53 to 54, plotting against him and hoping to catch him. So as we continue in our journey in Luke chapter 12 and on to the journey to Jerusalem, something to note is the the Pharisees and the lawyers are going to now start to resist Jesus fiercer and fiercer. Why is the question? Well, it's because they love themselves. They're so reliant on their self-righteousness and their goodness, thinking that God loves them rather than submitting to the mercy of God for how guilty they are. And so you're going to notice as the heart is hardened more in these people, they're going to resist all the more. And so that can... Oh, you have one thing? No. Uh, some of the things that we had skipped over are actually found in uh, previous episodes as we went through the Gospel of Matthew, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels, Gospels, which means they have similar uh, things in them. And so many of the things that we talked about, whether it's the Lord's Prayer or uh, the uh, the sign of Jonah, all those things you find in Matthew as well. So if you're more interested in some of those comments, you can find those in previous episodes uh, that are linked in with the Equip podcast, and so there's that, and if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out, and we'd love to help you guys any way we can. All right, well, that wraps up our daily Bible reading spotlight. Pastor, any one of the final words? The Lord be with you. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see you guys next week. 